Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world after having made our way into the Copper Age for the first time two episodes ago. And then last episode, we explored a little bit about what we can do with some of the new tools available to us, and we baked our first bread and pies in those two ovens behind me. In between episodes, I have been busy prepping for today's episode. First, I gathered a whole bunch more copper. I made some black currant jam. Then I ran out of honey for more jam. I realized we didn't have quite enough copper, so I got some more. I found a little bit of quartz, but not enough to really fill out more windows. I made a few more bars of copper and a replacement pickaxe. And then I patched up the wall of the vineyard, which is probably driving some of you crazy. And today, we are going to finally make use of this copper anvil that we made in the last episode. I'm going to pick this guy up and get him somewhere a little more out in the open. I'm thinking, let's put you right here. I'm getting really tired of these dumb, flippy doors that break every couple times you use them. And now it works fine. There we go. And I'm getting real tired of having to break these leaves down one by one when I want to shear a tree for sticks and seeds before I cut it down. And I'm also getting tired of having to spend days and days cutting these reeds one by one with a knife. And reeds aren't the only irritation with a knife because grass, while grass cuts quicker, it still burns through knives and I have to spend a whole lot of time mapping new knives. Through forging, we can find solutions for all of these annoyances in life. Vintage story life, that is. So how do we get into forging? Well, first of all, we need an anvil which we have right here. Second, we need a hammer, and this one's still doing pretty well. We're down to about half durability. Third, you need some ingots to work, and they do have to be cold ingots. You can't just pour straight from the crucible into uh, a forge or anything and expect to be able to work on an anvil. And lastly, you need a forge, which we don't have yet, but they are fairly simple to make. All you need is a little bit of cobblestone. Six pieces does it in sort of a U-shape in your crafting grid, and blam, got your forge. Let's just set this down here, that'll be easy. And naturally, the last thing you will need is a bit of fuel, because you do need to heat up the ingots before you can work them. So I'm gonna go ahead and put one piece of fuel in there, and we're gonna grab a couple ingots and toss them in. Now, you can heat up to four ingots at once, but since I'm going to be explaining as I go, I'll be working a little bit more slowly. So I'm gonna stick with two, and I may even have to reheat the second ingot up depending on how this goes. So once you have your fuel and your ingots in your forge, you need to crouch, make sure you crouch, and hold right click with your torch on the forge until it lights. The ingots will heat up over the course of a minute or so, and you'll be able to tell when they're about ready to work because they will start to glow. Uh, at about 800 degrees, they should be glowing mostly red, up to, I think the maximum is 1100 degrees and they'll sort of glow orange or yellow or white hot, depending on what metal you're talking about. Now you can work your metals when they're about 750 degrees Celsius. However, they will cool quickly on the anvil and so it's best to wait until they're as hot as they can get on however much fuel you have in there. So here we go, we're at 900. We're going to right click and take one of them and then we'll crouch and right click on the anvil. And then you get this menu. I think the first thing I'm going to make is a copper saw blade because we want to work with wood and not just the logs we've been using, but I want to work with wood planks. Then you have your hammer, and your hammer has several different modes. You have the default, which is a heavy hit that kind of smashes all the pixels or voxels in random directions. You have upset up, which moves one voxel up. Upset right does the same thing to the right. Upset down, upset left, and split. Split removes voxels. And what we have to do with this mini game is we have to move all these voxels so that they end up in line with all of these sort of wireframe voxels. And you do that by left clicking and you can sort of scoop the voxels around like that. Now, if you're working and you wanna get a better or different view of your work piece, what you can do is you can either walk around the anvil or just right click and it will rotate it 
uh, 90 degrees counterclockwise each time. So we're going to go ahead and finish up this saw blade. And then we will move on to the next tool. There are a few quirks about this mini game that you will want to know. For instance, if I move this voxel here to the left, I can't just hammer one more block to the left because that would sort of be like thinning out the metal too much. So in order to move a voxel like from here to the next one over, I need to roll it up first and then I can roll it left and then back down. And now that we have all of the voxels where they need to be, we have a whole bunch of extra ones that we have to get rid of before this is complete. So we'll pick the split option and we'll very carefully break away each of these extra voxels that we don't need. Now there is a delay between when you click your mouse and when the hammer hits because the, the click of your mouse raises the hammer and then it takes a moment to drop. So I'm click, 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 click. There's about a half a second in between each click and your hammer strike. Now we have our first saw and just like most tools we can drop it on top of a stick and can make our saw. Let's see, what should the next one be? I think I want to make a pair of shears next. So we're going to pick the shears and we're going to go ahead and start moving some voxels around. And some of these designs are simpler than others. Some of them actually require you to put two or more ingots together on top of the anvil. Although be aware that if you stack them higher than I think three, it might even be two and a half ingots high, some of the voxels on top will just sort of vanish into the ether because the workspace wasn't designed for larger amounts of items. Something you don't have to do but it can be fun is when you have a hot item you can throw it in water and it will cool down over time. And now we have a nice cool pair of shears, but since we are seraphs and we have hands made of asbestos, it really isn't a problem. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to make two more tools. I'm going to make a scythe head and a chisel, and then after that we will start talking about what each of these tools does. And there we have a full set of additional tools. We have chisel, copper shears, a copper scythe, and a copper saw. And our hammer is looking a bit worse to wear, although it's still got about 20% of its life left. So we're going to go hang him back up and talk about what we can do with some of these. In particular, I want to start with the copper saw, because I am sick to death of these dumb doors. It is time to upgrade to nice new ones that actually open and close and stay on their hinges when you're done with them. So I'm going to grab a little bit of wood out of here and we can now cut these logs into planks. And Each log will give us 12 planks. We'll start with 60 which is almost a full stack. And now that we have these planks we can finally start building some of the more advanced storage containers portals, i.e. doors and trap doors. We can make so many other things like tables and real beds if we have the other materials for them. So, so many things. These planks are so useful and once you get the ability to make planks, a whole other side of this game opens up. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to make two brand new doors. We're going to come down here and break this one first. There we go. Ah, uh, so much better, and it doesn't break. Let's go put our second one up here. There we go. 
so much better. As an added bonus, we can see through them. Now, despite these doors not having any apparent glass in their windows, they do count as a sealed block for the purposes of keeping heat in, which is going to be important as winter draws on because we do have a body temperature. And we've mostly been okay because it's been above zero degrees Celsius, but it can get down to negative 10, maybe even as low as negative 20 sometimes. And the combination of our house and nearby heat sources and our clothes, which are in very rough shape and will need to be repaired soon, will help keep us warm throughout the winter. Because if we don't stay warm, then we will require more food to stay warm because our hunger will get increased. And if it gets cold enough, we can also start taking damage. So let's see, what to do with you guys? You guys burn. Oh, you're my next fuel source. But wood isn't the only thing that we can cut with a saw. If we take down one of these pieces of glass, and hopefully it doesn't do what it just did. There we go. Let's put you back in place. If we take our saw and put it next to a piece of glass, on the right side apparently, we can then cut the glass in half and make two glass slabs. This can make our use of glass here far more efficient because now we can place the glass vertically as slabs like this and we just double the number of windows we can place. However, we can go a step further too. If we take some wood planks and a lead ingot, which we have over here, we can turn these into something even nicer looking and even more efficient. Now, I don't like the look of these maple logs because they're kind of green. So I'm going to instead use walnut logs and turn them into some planks and we'll make our windows out of this. So now we can take four of these, one full glass block and one lead ingot and we get four leaded glass panes. In this case, made out of walnut wood as the frame. And we can put these in our windows and they look much better than these sort of full chunky glass blocks. Now we only have that one lead ingot and we have two more pieces of lead ore in Galena, but we do have lead kind of all around us. We've marked lead right next to our house on the map, two more places very close by, and a whole bunch of it up to the northwest. So I think what we'll do is in the morning, we will go and we will ransack those ore deposits and bring all that Galena back here and we'll make a few more of these window panes and then a little something extra with that lead. Good morning, everyone. Now that the night has passed, it's time to go and mine us some lead ore. Let's get down there and let's get to work. And oh my, it is negative three degrees outside. So we'll want to keep an eye out on the edges of our screen because you'll get sort of like a vignette frost if you start to freeze. And I'll also just keep an eye out on my temperature here and there. I don't think it's too, too cold, although we did drop 0.1 degree. So since we have some galena right here, let's go ahead and we will we'll head down right here. And there it is right there. That was easy. Let's get a torch in hand. And let's dig away. And this is the first time that we have really mined anything on a hill. And as you can see, because the hill above us rises in that direction and the ground is lower in this direction, this disk of ore has generated sort of at an angle here. It follows the contour of the land. So like I said before, if you're mining in an area like this, you need to look not just around you, but also up and down. I think I want to go ransack these two lead deposits and then we'll come home because this is enough for uh, a few ingots plus some but we want a little bit more correction I want more so we're home now but um there happens to be a rift literally right outside our house so we can't get to this corner of the house without our 
gear spinning backwards and us having a pretend temporal storm with scary music. Okay, with that horror story over, let's get back to smelting our lead. Now, lead is a much softer mineral than, say, copper, and also has a much lower smelting temperature, only 327 degrees Celsius. Compare that to the copper at, was it, 1084 degrees, that means we don't need to use such hot burning fuel to smelt our lead. So I'm going to grab a little bit of probably just this peat, or maybe just the firewood, although we don't have as much firewood. I'll grab some peat, and we'll do our smelting with this peat. Aside from that, this works in the exact same way as smelting down the copper. Before I just start smelting and pouring lead into ingots, let's figure out how many we need to make. I want to fill all of these windows with leaded glass panes, and each lead ingot makes four panes, so we need one, two, three, four, five, six, and a half, seven, eight ingots. And we have enough here for 12, 15, probably 16 ingots. So eight ingots is not going to be a problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and in here, we're going to drop in six ingots worth there. There we go, eight ingots worth. And we'll go ahead and start this off by burning these stupid doors before we burn our peat. Let's get our eight ingot molds out and set them down here. Remember, asbestos feet, we can walk on them while they're still hot. And there we have our molten lead. Let's go ahead and pour all these. There we go. And let's put you back in here because we're going to use you again shortly. Now, while those are cooling, I want to turn our attention to a couple of the other tools we made, namely the shears and the scythe. So these two tools are both time savers and they are more efficient in terms of tool durability than using other tools for shearing things like leaves, for cutting grass, and for harvesting cooper's reeds and papyrus if you're down south. Now, it's too cold for these to grow back, so I won't be able to showcase the reed cutting, but I can take this scythe to some grass, and you'll see it just harvested five pieces of grass. If we were in a much fuller area, here we go, I think it'll do up to six at once. Yes, six at once. On top of that, this has 450 durability. Compare that to a knife made of flint and bone, which 75 durability, or even a copper knife, which has 300 durability. This is much more efficient durability-wise than using a copper or other knife to cut your grass. Now, copper scythes still aren't the most durable things in the world, and I'm going to want to upgrade this and probably not make many more copper scythes. But you can also use these for harvesting the cooper's reeds, and this is a serious time saver because the knives take much longer to harvest these, and if you're in a real hurry, you can use them to harvest your crops. And they will only harvest crops that are fully grown. And look, it's actually cold enough now that we're getting ice in our little pond. Cool. Now, the real time saver here are these shears. And again, these have a much higher durability, 1,000, than, say, our copper axe at 250. But watch the difference in terms of how many leaves the shears. If I break them by hand, I get one by one. I break them with shears, I take out entire sections of this tree at once. I think this is sort of another either four blocks or six blocks at once kind of deal. And you get the same drop rate with shears as you do when harvesting by hand. So you get plenty of sticks, plenty of seeds, and so on. And now with that tree bare, we can cut this tree down ever so quickly. And we're done. No more spending 12 hours trying to break all the leaves off a tree first. Well, here's our chance to maybe see some more bees in action. If we leave these in the freezing cold for too long, they actually will reset their honey timer, so we may as well collect them now. 
And there we go. There's our first little set of bees, and they're so angry. Now, they hit us once, but since we have these straw dummies here, they're actually going to sort of focus on them more than on us. Okay, I think these lead ingots ought to be done by now. Let's put these guys back on the racks, and yes, we have cold lead ingots. Perfect. So, let's go ahead and fill in these windows. Sorry, Mr. Shell. I want to find a new spot for you. Like here. And there we go. We now have a fully sealed house. Now, this is a little larger than the normal 7x7x7 seven by seven by seven limitations. We have a 7x9x7 seven by by seven interior. I don't know if the heat bonus from having a solid room is negated entirely or if it's just a penalty, but we'll find out in the long run, I guess. Now, the last couple of things I wanted to hit today is we have access to some new and finally attractive light sources. We have candles, we have glass, we have metal. We can make lanterns. Lanterns are sort of the... Actually, they're not sort of. Lanterns are the best light source in the game. They won't go out when you go underwater. They have the largest light radius. You can even buff their light radius a little bit with a gold or silver plate. And they also can look attractive, and they come in many different colors. If you look up lantern in the handbook and spell it right, there are many different kinds of lanterns. They even have different lanterns based on the kind of glass you put in them. And if you get really crazy and get your hands on some colored glass, that will actually change the color of the light that your lantern emits. So my personal favorite kind of lantern is made from Molybdo Chalcos. These just look real nice. They have sort of a, a wrought iron look without actually requiring iron. To make this, we have to get into alloying, which is a topic we haven't touched on yet, although I think I mentioned it in the last episode with the potential for bismuth bronze. Alloys are, of course, the mixture of two metals to make a new material. And molybdochalcos is a combination of lead and copper. In particular, we need 88 to 92% lead and 8 to 12 percent copper. Now I like to try to maximize the amount of copper that goes in and minimize the amount of lead because lead is notably less common than copper, although it may not seem quite that way in the area that we're in. But overall we will find lots more copper than we will lead. So I'm going to smash as much lead as I possibly can in here and see how much copper I can put in to make as much molybdenum chalcos as possible. I'm not sure we're going to quite hit 10 ingots. I think it's going to be more like 9. As part of the alloying process, you do have to use fuel that can melt the hottest of the metals that you put in. In this case, the copper. So while the lead would liquefy with just firewood, or even sticks, we do need the hotter burning brown coal, charcoal, or black coal for copper. But we are going to, as always, preheat, and I'll bring y'all back as we are pouring this stuff. And actually, while that is still smelting, I want to go and fix a problem we have with lighting out here, because I don't want rifts spawning right outside my door again. So I think if we just put a few lights here, this should help keep rifts away. Rifts will only spawn in areas where the light level is 2 or less, 
and these have light level 11. So between them all, we should be okay. And there we are. Our crucible with 9 ingots worth of Melvited Chalcos. And this whole time, one of my cats has been sleeping about 2 feet from my right ear up in his cat tree. And every time I forget he's there, he snores a little bit. And it spooks me, thinking that maybe there's a monster in our house. It gets me every time. It's the worst. I'm going to sleep so that these can cool by morning. And then we will both showcase how to put multiple ingots onto an anvil. And I will show you the proper way to make a lantern. Good early and dark morning, everyone. It is time to pick up all of these ingots. I'm going to throw one of them in here because we need two ingots for each lantern, which is kind of unfortunate. And then, as before, we need to put them in here. Go ahead and light that. And accidentally pick up our one ingot. Now this hammer has 17 durability left, so we're going to grab our second hammer, and we will just let the game automatically replace our broken hammer with a fresh one while we are working. So in order to make a lantern, we need to make a plate. And Melibita Chakos can only be turned into plates, which is why it does not give us a menu interface for selecting what we're going to make. And from here, we are going to simply hammer this out into a flat square. Starting with heavy hits, spreading things out as much as possible. And sometimes you'll hit these and they won't go anywhere because they are somewhat random with a bias towards moving downward. And there we go, our first hammer just broke. Making plates is not exactly my favorite pastime. Luckily, in the future, when we get to the process of automation via wind power, we will be able to mostly automate the process of making plates. We will still have to heat them ourselves and place them ourselves, but then we will be able to have an automated hammer that can just smash out plates for us. That's a little ways away though, so for now, we get to blow through a thousand hammers. And if you made your plate right, then you should have three voxel bits left over. So it's a bit of a tight one. You don't want to accidentally knock out any voxels before you're ready. And then, with our plate in hand, we take our plate, we can take two plain glass slabs. Now this can actually be made with clear quartz, but I like the nice sort of crystal clear look of the glass, because if we put clear quartz chunks in here, you get kind of a, a milky glass instead. And I'm not as big of a fan of that as I am of this nice clear stuff. See, it might be hard to see in YouTube, but that is a sort of milkier glass. So we're going to just use the glass slabs that we cut earlier, and we now have our very first lantern. I'm going to take this stupid thing off our bar, and there we have beautiful, bright light. Lanterns, just like everything else, can be placed, and they will actually make a little connector if you place them out on a wall or if you place them hanging, like so. And if you place things at an angle, this is true for many things, actually not just lanterns, they will actually be placed at, I think, 22 and a half degree intervals. So you can have something like 12 or 16 different angles for these things. We're gonna hang on to this first one. I'm gonna make a couple more, and we're gonna replace these torches around the house with lanterns.
And like that, we have three plates and an almost dead last hammer. And with the three candles, I made two more from these this bee wax here by lining it up in a single line in the crafting grid. I can go ahead and actually only make two more lanterns because I don't have enough glass. That's okay. We can now put, I think we'll put this one there actually. We'll move this over to here where we will make use of it so that we always have a lit torch near our fire. And then we have one more lantern to carry with us. With all that done, there are a few more things I want to do around the house. And then we'll call the episode. First item, this door. There we go. The second thing I want to do are shutters. The third thing I want to do is get this door ready for burning. And the fourth thing I want to do is I want to play around with this chisel a bit. Chiseling is a concept that we haven't really gotten into, and I don't want to get too deep into it right now, but I want to sort of take care of some of this flatness we have on our home. I don't like this sort of flat bit here. It's just sort of one color into the next. And I tried playing around with some cobblestone ledges and such, and it just didn't look great. At least not to me. Although, now that we can chisel, I might be able to make some smaller sills. For instance, if I take this chisel and I right-click, these now become chiseled blocks, and I can bring up the menu, and I can chip away at these. So these are approximately stair blocks, and these are look too bulky to me. So what if we do something more like this? That's not too bad. I might go with a wooden sill next time, but for now, we'll just do this. When you're chiseling, the left click button removes material and the right click adds it. You do want to be careful because it is pretty easy to accidentally turn adjacent blocks into chisel projects without really trying. Well, that helps so much. What I really wanted to do, though, was I wanted to see if I could chisel something on, say, here. And let's do that. Let's try this. Sort of just push back this second brick here. Maybe even one more. Then we'll use the smallest size. That would certainly add some depth to it, and I like it. I just don't know that I want to use copper chisels to do this. I think for now we will stick with just these stone sills and we will return to chiseling out a bit of this dark mud brick at a later date. Well, everyone, that's about all we have time for in this episode. We had a pretty big day today exploring things like alloys and smithing and chiseling and using saws to cut wood into planks for all manner of cool things and redecorating the house. 
We will be certain to revisit some of these concepts in the next episodes, especially ones involving the saw and wood. But for now, I think we have made some really good progress on the house. Anyway, my name has been Kurazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.